uh, we'll talk more in a second, but it talks about learning how to control your body, not in passionate lust. I'll be honest with you, um, just as this church was probably struggling with some type of sexual morality, I would say that many Christians grow up in their spiritual lives and have struggles in these areas um, because they've never been taught, they've never learned, we don't talk about these things in the youth groups, we don't bring them up in, uh, our junior, with our junior highs, um, but many times I think that in trying to protect these youth, we actually endanger them because we don't address what they're up against. We don't talk about it. We don't bring it up. And I fear that many young kids, many young adults are touched, some of them even destroyed in some ways, because it's never been addressed. This text tells us that we, may, we must learn to keep our bodies pure and sanctified. There's some things that need to be, there's some knowledge, a knowledge base that needs to be transferred from a father to a son, from a mother to a daughter, in order for them to be made holy. But many times these areas are missed. Many times these things are left out even within the church. And by doing that in the church, we have endangered a generation, I'm afraid of. Endangered a generation. This specific church, the Thessal Thessalonica, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, their culture, the Greco-Roman culture, was even worse than many of our cultures. In their culture, they would, have, they would have thousands of temple prostitutes. When the family would march off to Sunday worship, they would march off to have sex because that was part of the worship. Sex was worship. When you got married, marriage wasn't to fulfill sexual desires. Marriage was to move into a higher position of authority, to, to bring, to bring a favor to the family, but it wasn't to fulfill sexual desires mistresses and concubines and things like that were for that reason, but not in this culture. Homosexuality was exalted in the Greco-Roman culture, specifically among men. The highest form of sex was with the man because men had authority. So therefore, we have poetry from Romans and Greeks exalting pedophilia with boys. It was a culture that was depraved, even more depraved than our own cultures, I would say. And so, as we see here, what was going on was probably the fact that they had not learned. It's kind of implied. You must learn how to keep your body pure. Because they had come out of training, conforming by their society that had a, a different ideology about sex. We see in the Corinthian church, which is Greek, Greco-Roman, they kind of combined. They were still having sex with temple prostitutes. 1 Corinthians 6, he's like, look, if you have sex with a temple prostitute, you become one with this prostitute. He's warning them against this. There were problems in the church. And as we talked about before, we can deny it. We can cover it up. We can try to act like there's nothing happening in our churches. But the reality is the Bible prepares us for what is going on in our own church. It prepares us for what's going on in our own lives. And there is sexual immorality happening in the church. Let's not hide it. Let's not cover it up. There is pornography. There is masturbation. There is oral sex. In fact, I would say that many couples that have not learned how to keep their body pure will think, well, I'm not having sex, so as long as I do this, I'm okay. That's happening in the church. Let's be open about it. That's the reality because nobody's ever taught them what sex really is. It's all the above. And so they open those doors thinking that it's okay as long as I'm not having intercourse. That's happening in the church. Last week or a couple weeks ago, one of the things we talked about was what are some things we must learn? What are some things we must learn if we are going to keep our bodies pure in a generation that has a different definition of what sex is? When I was in a seminary, I had to do a report for a youth ministry class. I had to do a report on a junior high that there was a breakout of STDs. And in this rich community, in this junior high, the junior high kids were having orgies. Orgies, you know, means sex free for all, called hookups. In America, they call it hookup. You just hook up with anybody. So I had to do a report about this because this was happening in our societies. How does a youth pastor, how does a minister minister to these kids that are doing things with their bodies they don't even really understand? These things are happening, and we must address them. So how do we stay pure in a culture, in a society that has a different ideology than what the Bible teaches? How do we do that? We talked about three things last, last week. First thing was, 
we must define sexual morality. We must understand what it is. It is fulfilling sexual desires outside of marriage. That includes fantasies. It includes masturbation. It includes anything that is fulfilling your desires of sex outside of marriage. God created it, and he gave the rules for it, how it was supposed to be filled. And it's supposed to be fulfilled in a monogamous relationship with the person that cares for you and wants the best for you and is as committed to you. And all things outside of that is against God's purpose for the man and woman in our society. We must define it. We must realize, what is it? The second thing we looked at is the Bible teaches that if we are going to be able to stay pure, learn how to keep our bodies pure, we must learn how to control our eyes. Job said this, I have made a covenant with my eyes that I will not lust after a young lady. That means that Job didn't mean he didn't still see pretty women or girls that he thought he was attractive, but he learned how to move his eyes. He learned how to just keep on walking. He learned how to say, and I'll be honest, I used to say this, I was like, before I was married, oh goodness, that girl is so pretty, I will never look at her again. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I used to say that. That's, I learned a covenant that if I was going to be pure, that I must make this covenant with my... Thank you, Jesus. Bless her. Amen. I'm moving on. She'll never get these eyes ever again. You must learn how to make a covenant with your eyes. The third thing we talked about was you must learn how to guard your ears. Now, this is something that many of us probably are, are not very familiar with. James chapter 3 talks about the, the mouth or the tongue is like a rudder that guides a large ship. People's lives are guided by what they hear. You start to believe that you can succeed in life or that you're going to be a failure in life many times by what has been spoken over you. And there's power there. And Satan realizes if he can get your ears with the music, if he can get your eyes with the TV and get your conversations where you're joking about sexual morality and you're playing around with it, that means he can direct the future or direct your destiny by the words, by what is spoken. That's the hope by preaching, that we would direct your life by preaching God's words. And then it would guide your life like a rudder. Well, the enemy does more preaching than we do. In fact, I know many Christians that will be rocking and dancing to all this music that's demonic and it's lyrical pornography. They sit in church four or five hours a day listening to sexual morality and then wonder how come they can't keep themselves pure. Duh. Duh. The tongue guides your life. If you are going to stay pure, you must learn these principles. If the enemy can get your ear, he can affect your destiny, and especially here with sexual morality. Well, what's the fourth principle? This is what we didn't get a chance to get to last time I spoke, which makes this sermon long, but I only have a limited amount of time either way. The next principle you must learn is that if you are going to be pure, you must declare war. You must become hostile in order to keep yourself pure and godly in this culture. And let me tell you something. There are many Christians that are not willing to declare war, to battle in order to be holy, and therefore they will not. What do we, where do I see this at? Turn with me to Matthew 5, 29. Matthew 5, 29. This is what it says. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, this terminology obviously is symbolic, so don't get any ideas about plucking out eyeballs or anything like that. This, this, this uh, terminology was a terminology used for war. Even when you look in the Old Testament, you will find that when Samson was caught by his enemies, what did they do? They plucked out his eyes. Why? So that he couldn't harm them anymore. You see there's a time when uh, Israel or one part of Israel was negotiating with another tribe, and they're like, okay, we're going to declare peace. Okay, but only if we can pluck out your right eye. Part of the reason they would, sometimes they would uh, cut off the fingers because then they could not battle you again. They could not come after you. When Christ uses this terminology, he's saying you must be drastic 
in trying to be holy in your life. You must develop an animosity, especially in regarding to lust, if you are going to be holy. If your eye offends you, what you, what your, if your eye offends you, meaning what you look at, then you must be willing to get rid of it. If it causes you to stumble, the internet, the, the movies, then you must be willing to get rid of it in order to be holy so that it will never affect you again. I have had friends who have gotten rid of their TV, and look, I'm just not going to be able to do it. I, I, before I was married, I didn't have the internet. When I got married, my wife wanted the internet. I was like, man, you want the internet? Oh, the internet's caused me some problems. I don't know if I want the internet in my house. If you are going to be holy and you find that something causes you to sin, you must be drastic. If you're in a relationship or with your, the analogy talks about with your, if, if your hand offends you, what you do. Uh, another parallel passage says if your feet offend you, where you go. If you're going to places, if you're watching things that cause you to stumble, you must become, develop an animosity. Declare war in order to be holy. I'll be honest with you. There's a lot of people that can't be holy because they're not willing to declare war. They don't, they don't have any animosity. Oh, but I love him. Oh, but we think we might get married. I kind of think we might get married. I love him, and so I, I, I don't know if I'm willing to cut this relationship. Look, if you are going to be holy, that means that some things that are very precious to you, like your eyeball, like your hands, and like your feet, some things that are very intimate to you, because typically the things that are very close to you are the things that can hurt you most, things that can cause you to stumble. If you're going to be holy, then you're going to have to be willing to be willing to let go of some things that are very close and intimate to you, meaning that we can watch a movie, but you've got to sit on that couch over there, and we've got to have friends over because we can't do that. And if, if this doesn't work, we might have to end this relationship because I have decided that I'm going to declare war in order to be holy. Are you willing to have animosity? Are you willing to have an, an anger towards sin in your life? Because unless you do this, you will find that you're going to be prone to continue to stumble. Unless it gets to that point, you'll find that you'll be stuck. Oh, I don't know what to do. Yes, you do. Cut it off. Yes, you do. Get rid of it. Yes, you do. The Bible's clear. You must develop an animosity. You must declare war if you are going to be holy. And if you love it so much, your eyeball, you, lo you love it so much, this TV show, you love it so much, this magazine or this relationship, then you might not be able to be holy. Let's be realistic. You have to declare war. What else? What's another principle we must learn if we are going to be holy? We talked about guarding your eyes, guarding your ears. You must also learn how to guard your mind. Your mind, it's often been said, the battle for your life is waged in your mind. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This is what it says, 10 verse 4. The weapons we fight, we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Listen to this. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now, Paul in this passage is talking about spiritual warfare, the weapons that we fight with. He's not talking about literal weapons. And one of the things that he mentions is specifically learning how to guard your mind. It's not rocket science. One of the aspects of spiritual warfare is learning how to guard your thought process. In the Hebrew, I, could, I didn't get a chance to look up this verse. I was thinking about it as I was meditating. Um, but there's a, there's a verse that says something like, your word makes the simple wise. In the Hebrew, the simple means, uh, it actually means an open door. That many people just have open doors with their mind. Anything that comes in, whatever thought, they don't guard against it. They don't fight against thoughts. It's just an open door. They accept, they believe anything. If you are going to learn how to fight spiritual warfare and become holy, you're going to have to learn how to start taking captive thoughts. And this isn't just dealing with lust, obviously. It means anxiety. It means fear. It means anger. It means anything that you realize, the word makes the simple wise. Anything that contradicts what the word of God says, you must start to realize this is not of God and I reject this. Lord, I bring this to submission to Christ. Lord, I bring these thoughts. This is not your will for my life. But others, the simple, the simple is just an open door. 
They're angry at everybody. They're lusting. They're fantasizing in the midst of a classroom. They can't focus in service because they got all these lustful thoughts because they're simple-minded. Their mind is an open door. And they've never said, no, I've got to close this. This is not for me to think about. You must choose to reject some thoughts and no longer allow certain things to come into your mind or for you to fantasize. And when they do come in there, you bring them to Christ and say, God, I reject this in Jesus. This is not of you. I reject this in Jesus' name. Have you learned how to guard your mind? Or are you the open door where anything can get into your mind and your thoughts? Now, here's a very practical one. Be careful with your free time. If you are going to learn how to sanctify your body, to keep your body whole, this is a very practical one that most people probably never think about. You must be careful with your free time. The statistics say this, that most men and women who struggle with pornography or masturbation or et cetera, the reason they do is not because they just got overwhelming lust. It's because they're so bored. They're so bored. They're bored with life. They're bored at night. They don't know what to do, so they play around on the Internet and they get themselves in trouble. They're bored. One of the areas that Satan is going to attack specifically is your free time. He'll bring loneliness. He'll bring lust. He wants that time. Can, do we have any uh, biblical examples of this? I think so. When we see the story of David when he falls into adultery, let me tell you something. I think this is a picture of boredom. Turn with me to 2 Samuel 11.1. 1. 2 Samuel 11.1. 1. I want you to see how the narrator is trying to point out something that's going wrong in David's life. This is what it says. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, he's up late at night, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. He can't sleep. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. He says, hmm. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanness. Then she went back home. Now, one of the things that would be normal and throughout the narratives that you find about David is that David was a warrior. David always went out to battle. That's what the kings did. This is a time where he should be doing his job. But instead of doing his job, David decides, I'm going to stay at home. You know, it's like summer vacation. Let me tell you something. Be careful about winter vacation. Be careful about summer vacation. Being at home, can't sleep. Those are dangerous times. And I would find, I'll be honest with you, most of my youth, when I used to be a youth pastor, you'd think, okay, summer vacation is a time where you get to really focus on God. Of course, you had your studies. You were missing church because of your studies. Dummy, what are you thinking? You know, all of a sudden, you've got all this time. But what happens is these kids would stumble farther away from God during the summer because they had all this time, and they did not know what to do with it. The devil wants your time. Let me give you another example to tell you that, to reveal to you just how the enemy wants your time. Turn to 1 Timothy 5.13. 1 Timothy 5.13 says this, talking about widows in the church, it says, besides, they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house, and not only do they become idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying things they ought not do. Paul's talking about the people, their husbands had died, they were widows, but because they had so much time on their hands, they started to become gossips and busybodies and talking about people. They were the women that all the, the, the telephone, they just called people and tell all the secrets and things that were going on because they had nothing else to do with their time. Their assumption, in fact, say, tell this to people, when people are all in your business, tell them, like, get a life. Go have, get a hobby. Go do something fun. Quit worrying about me. I'm not worried about you. Don't worry about me, right? Get a hobby. Do something with yourself. It's, there's, there's some truth to the fact that it says, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. That is very true. The enemy wants to use your free time. So what do we do when we have some time late at night? What do you do when you're like David and you can't sleep and you decide, well, I've got to go do something. What am I going to do? What do you do with your time, your free time? Let me give you a verse that I think helps answer that. Ephesians 5, 15. 
Ephesians 5, 15 says this. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every, every opportunity because the days are evil. This is what Paul says. He says, if what you need to do in order to stay out of this evilness that's part of our age is that you need to make the most, and it actually can be translated, redeem the time. Buy up your time. Make the best of your time. And obviously, Paul being an apostle means that get involved in serving. Do God's will for your life. You'll find that many of the people that are stuck in these habitual sins or habitual lusts, or et cetera, many of them aren't involved with the things that they should be doing, like David. In that time frame with David, part of the way they advanced the kingdom was they were supposed to declare, or, uh, win, the, or win all the land that, were, that was God's in Israel. That was his commandment. That's what Joshua was supposed to do. That's what David was supposed to do. In one sense, he wasn't advancing the kingdom of God by taking the land that God had given them. And many Christians are like that as well. There is a land that God has given us, but instead of getting involved, instead of advancing the kingdom of God, we allow and just give our time to whatever, and we find that we are open doors for the enemy to draw us away. Use your time for God. That's what it means by make the most of your opportunities. Use your time late at night. You can't sleep. Spend some time praying, right? That's what I do. Helps me fall asleep every time. <laughs> Prayer, you just start falling asleep, right? Start, you, you're, you're busy, you've got a, a CC on campus, you've got all these things that you're involved in, but are you advancing the kingdom of God? Start getting and making the most of your opportunity. Be wise with your time. Many times, people that are not or really having battles aren't involved doing the work of the kingdom of God. Get involved. What else? What else must we do if we are going to learn how to keep our bodies holy? We must give attention to the word of God. Turn with me to Psalm 119.9. Psalm 119.9. This is what it says. So David says, the man who had his struggles, how can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. Now, David's probably, you know, 70, 80 years old. He's had his stumble in adultery, and he starts to talk to these young men specifically. Let me tell you how to escape the pornography. He was a pornographer. Watch. Let me escape. Every time he had a struggle, he'd just go marry another woman and start having immorality or get a new concubine. This is a person who had a tremendous struggle in this area. He says, one of the things that I've learned was if I would have given more attention to the word of God, I would have remained pure. If I had spent more time in the word of God, I would have remained pure. One of the ways that you are going to learn how to keep your body is by giving yourself to the word. Let me give you another verse. Galatians 5.16. Galatians 5.16 says this. So I say, live by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. The Spirit is the one who wrote the Word of God. And one of the ways that you live by the Spirit, his thoughts, his mind, is by living in the Word of God. And you will find as you make your devotion and your passion being in the Word of God that the desires of the flesh, you want to be angry, you want to smush, smash somebody's head who upsets you, you'll find that you'll have a little bit more peace. You'll find that when you normally start to worry and have anxiety in life, that the desires of the flesh will start to have less power over you. When you start to want to lust, you'll have, they'll have less power over you because of the Word of God. I'd have young men in my church who would have struggles. And one of the things I would do is I'd take them to Galatians 5.16 and say, Do you believe it? This is what it says. That if you live by the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. So what I would do is I'd make them a plan. I'm a personal trainer, so I do that with spiritual training as well. I say, look, we're going to put you on a spiritual bodybuilding plan. And what we would do is I, I, I write up a plan. I say, in the morning when you wake up, first thing, before you get on the internet, time with God and the Word. And then, you know how you usually stumble at night like David? You know, you told me, you know, look at where, you know, if your eye offends you, we're going to make you go to bed a little bit earlier. And what we're going to do is before you go to bed at 10 o'clock, not even before, not 10 o'clock, I want you to give God your best. You go to bed at 12, let's make it 10. 
I put them on the word, and all of a sudden, they'd be like, Greg, it's so amazing. And I also tell them, I was like, you got to get rid of the secular music because, again, once the ears, and I'm not saying secular music bad, but their music was bad. <laughs> so, and all of a sudden, they'd be like, Greg, it's so amazing. And I, and I tell them, only for two weeks, but if I tell you to do it for the rest of your life, you're not going to, it's too big of a goal, you can't do it. Let's do two weeks. And they'd be like, oh, Greg, it's so cool, man. When you're living by the Spirit, I don't even think about that stuff anymore. I'm not even struggling no more because the word, if I'm living by the Spirit, it's so awesome. After the two weeks, guess what happens? <laughs> right? Because it, all, the disciplines that we put into their lives, they no longer practice. Living by the Spirit wasn't a lifestyle. It was something that I had made them do for two weeks. But after that, they weren't willing to keep it up. And I'm like, look, you know the answer. I've showed you the answer. You need a lifestyle change. You've been living in your secular thoughts and living in this, this junk, and you have been undisciplined with your time, and you stumble because you're living the wrong type of lifestyle. Now, if we change your lifestyle and allow you to live by the word of God, there's power there. And you will not fulfill the... So you know the answer. So you're not an addict. You, can't, you can break it. You know it. But what can I do? I can only show you how to do it. You've got to continue this for the rest of your life. And they don't want to. So therefore, they go... That's, live, if you are going to... How does a young man keep his way pure? By living by the word of God. Living by the Spirit. The Spirit wrote the Word. You want to think the way the Spirit does? You must start to saturate yourself with the Word of God. And you will find that there's power there to break whatever desire is coming up, whether it's anger, whether it's lust, whether it's unforgiveness. You'll find that He changes you as you live in the Word of God. What's another principle? If we are going to learn how to keep our bodies pure, accountability and prayer. Accountability in prayer. Turn to James 5, verse 16. James 5, verse 16. We use this every Thursday night in our prayer service. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Let me tell you what often happens with people that have addictions. Many times, people that are walking in addictions, especially lust addictions, it's in the dark. Nobody knows about it. They're not sharing it with anybody. They're not being open. I've got this struggle in my life. I need prayer. I've got this struggle. How can you help me? Many of them keep it in the dark. And what happens is as you keep things in the dark, it becomes greater and it becomes more powerful. If you are a Christian that is walking without accountability... Walking without, in this specific verse, the verses before talk about going to the elders. So this is probably talking about spiritual authority. But I think it applies to Christian accountability in general. If you are willing to be open and to share your struggles, your lust, your anger whatsoever, and start to confess and have prayer, then you will start to have the ability to break it. You'll be healed in some way. I believe that's one aspect that we must add to our life. What happens if we don't confess? What happens if we don't confess to God or confess to others? Turn with me to 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. I want you to see this. This is important to understand. 1 Timothy 4, 1. Now, this is totally off the subject, but it, it applies. Um, 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. It's talking about false teachers that would arise in the end times. Stay with me. Look at verse 2. Such te teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. So Paul tells us, now we're going to go a little deeper, about how there'll be all this false teaching, false pastors that are living and teaching the wrong word. And it's going to come through demons. But he, wants, he tells us how this happens. These people, hypocritical, means that they were living two lives. They, had two, they, had, they were a Christian at church, but in their own life, they had all these struggles that never were coming out. And what happens is, their consciences, meaning that your conscious conviction says this is wrong, get right, it stops working on them. And eventually the demons start to have power in their life. We've all experienced this in some way. I was a kid. You know, I was, I was saved at seven years old. But I really struggled with cursing until I was a, a freshman in college. I would go to school and be like, I'm not going to curse a day. Somebody would foul me in practice, I'd curse them out, and I'd be like, well, I curse them, I curse the rest of the day and pray and ask for forgiveness to start over tomorrow, right? But what would happen was, when I would, uh, what would start to happen was, as I would start to curse or do something wrong, 
Usually I'd be convicted, but after a while, let's say I decided I wasn't going to try to get right, I would stop being convicted. I could curse and not be upset. I could be cursed and the Holy Spirit wouldn't convict me. And what would start to happen was my conscience would start to be seared. No longer would be I be bothered about my sin. And the same thing with immorality. You start to live in immorality. You're touching. You're going farther. In the beginning, you feel bad. But later, you don't feel bad anymore. And you start to live a double life. You start to live a double life. And what happens is it opens the door. This verse specifically talks about demonic struggles. I believe there are a lot of people in sexual morality that not only is it a physical problem, but it's become a spiritual problem. That all of a sudden, their double life, not sharing, keeping things in the dark, the enemy has started to create a stronghold, and it becomes hard for them to break because they're living two lives. If you are going to get rid of whatever struggle you have, you must start to have an open life. Not only confessing with God, but being willing to confess to your brother. To a, not to any brother. I want you, there's some wisdom that comes with this because some people, you don't want to tell them nothing. They may be Christians, but they're going to tell everybody. You don't want to tell them. You need to make sure it's some right people that you trust that are godly. It says the righteous prayer, the prayers of a righteous. But you want to find somebody who's righteous and living for God and you can trust so that you can open up and share your struggles with. Because prayer, especially of a righteous man or a righteous woman, is powerful. If you are going to learn how to keep your body you must stop keeping things in the dark and start to have accountability and prayer. What's the next one? I think we have two more. You must define the relationship. Define the relationship. Turn with me to 1 Timothy 5.1. 1 Timothy 5.1. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers. Verse 2. Older women as mothers and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. One of the reasons I had struggles, again, I shared that nobody ever taught me fully what I must do to keep my body pure. So I had struggles. So when I had my first girlfriend when I was a freshman in college, and I was a late bloomer, I had my first girlfriend, one of the things that starts to happen is nobody had taught me how should this relationship be. How do I have a girlfriend? And how, what are the boundaries? How far can I go? So I'm like, well, I guess kissing's okay, and I guess this is okay. And what it leads into more stuff or whatsoever. But the problem is many Christians have never learned what the relationship should be like. So therefore, they define their relationships, their CC relationships and et cetera, by what the world says. They've watched the TV, and then it's the kissing, and it's the second base, and it's third base, and then it's the home run. They say, this is normal. So when they get into their relationships... They start to de they define their relationships as the world does. Well, what does the Bible say about what your CC relationship should be like if you're going to have one? Or your engagement relationship if you're going to have one? What should it be like when you're engaged? Treat it as a younger, young woman, as a sister, with absolute purity. Until you are married, that person should be like a sister. Now, I don't have a sister. But I, I may have told you before, but... If we have a daughter, which I just feel like I'm one of those guys who's going to have a daughter. I just know it. I know I'm going to be a dude that got a daughter, right? And I've already told my wife that if I have a daughter, if we have a daughter, then I'm going to go ahead and put on 20, 30 pounds of muscle, and I'm going to be the biggest, scariest black pastor you've ever seen, right? <laughs> and anybody that tries to come around my daughter, I'm laying down the elbows. Look, son. <laughs> Look, son. You see me? <laughs> In fact, I'll be honest with you. When I was a... Uh, substitute teacher. I used to go and work with like kindergarten kids and, or, and teach. I, I'd always made sure I wore a really tight shirt because I was a lot bigger back then. So I wanted to be intimidating. And I walk into the classroom and I'd be like, look, this is how it's going to be. These kindergartners did not care how I looked or how big I was. And I'd be like, don't you, you scared of me? I'm bigger than you. What are you they just run over me. They just didn't care. But the junior high kids, they'd be like, how much do you bench press? You know, and they asked me. They were scared. And so they would listen. But the kindergartners, nah, they didn't care nothing. <laughs> They just, I felt like kindergarten cop up in there. They just did not care. <laughs> but my point is, if you are going to have, learn how to keep your body well, you must have already decided, where, how far is the line? What would I do with a sister that I was trying to keep pure? What would I do with my natural brother that I wanted to stay holy and wait till he got married? How would I treat that relationship, even while I'm engaged, because there's no difference. In fact, in the Old Testament, or in the, in the, in the Bible, 
betrothal was like marriage, engagement. That means if you cheated, you would die. They would kill you. If you committed adultery while you're betrothed, it's not the same as being engaged today. The only difference, what we have here, this is the, 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 the passage that would define your relationship before you are married. That's what your CC relationship should be like. That means if maybe you can hold hands with your sister, but you're probably not going to stick your tongue down her throat. And if you do, you come from a really weird culture. <laughs> you know, that's not normal. We don't, we don't do that in America. You know, brothers and sisters at a certain age don't even hold hands anymore. It's the truth. You must define what it means to keep your sister with all purity. And let me tell you something. Most of what goes on on Handong isn't that. Let me tell you the truth. Most of what goes on in the media is not that. That is the biblical definition. And most Christians have never been taught this, so when they get into their CC relationships, they define it the way the world does. And they go from holding hands, and it's the best experience in the world, but all of a sudden you hold hands and it doesn't, you don't get anything from it anymore. And so you go to second base, you kiss them, and all of a sudden it's the best experience. But next thing you know, you're kissing, you don't feel anything. So you find that you have to keep going further. And then you're trying all your hardest not to break the line, you know, or you're just breaking the line, whatever. So if you define your relationship the way that your drama movies do or the way that your love, you know, your happy love stories do, then you're going to struggle with sexual immorality. You must learn how to define the relationship. I am going to keep you pure, and we are going to pray and see if this is God's will for us to get married. And until the day we get married, you are my sister with all purity. I am going to guard your mind. I'm going to guard your body with all of my heart because that is what the Bible tells me I should do. You must define your relationship if you are going to learn how to keep yourself and the other person's body pure. Nobody talks about this in the church. We need to learn what it means to define our relationship and keep our bodies pure. Here's the last one, and then we'll close. You must claim your victory in Christ. You must claim your victory in Christ. Romans 6.6 6 says this. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Turn with me to verse 10. Or is it 11? Verse 11. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. When you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, something miraculous happened. And many times the only thing that we talk about in church is that the penalty of your sin was paid for. But Christ's death was so much more powerful than that. This verse tells us that when Christ died, so did my sin, meaning the power principle in my life. And so he says, our old self was crucified with him, meaning that I'm no longer the same. My sin principle, the power that was ruling my life that helped draw me into these things and control me and make me a slave is no longer in power in my life. And so when you look at the scripture, you often see things like they call them saints. They call them uh, holy and pure, even though they got struggles. They're different because the power principle has died. So did Christ not only die to pay your penalty, but to break the power? This is what Paul says in verse 11. In the same way, count yourself dead. This means that there needs to be a mental change. That's why we do preaching, because the way you think affects the way that you live. I use this illustration in my uh, Christian foundations. If I went and got uh, hypnotized, and they told me I was a pig, right? Me and my wife would be walking up the street, and I would see a puddle, and I'd be like, sorry, babe, and I'd jump over in a puddle and just dive bomb and start rolling in and woggling, because mentally, I think I'm a pig, so I'm going to act like a pig. So many Christians, because they don't know that they are changed, don't know that there is a power broken in their lives, they still live and act like the world. Paul says, let this affect your thinking. Count, a mental thing. You must count yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. 
I've shared this before. Uh, I had a real struggle with uh, lust um, when I was in college. Um, and I would fast. I would pray. I would do all I could thinking, like, God, how come I'm not beating this? How come I'm not being pure? And one of the things that God taught me was through this verse. He wanted me to know that I had an identity change. That no longer was I the same. Because one of the things that Satan does in your life is he lies to you. You can't ever be free. You're going to be this way. You, you're, gonna be, you're just an angry person. You're just a, 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 a jealous person. Your dad was this way. You're just like that. But that is a lie. We must learn who we are. In fact, when you read the scripture, what you're doing for the rest of your life is finding out what God has already done in your life, and you're starting to live according to it. I'm not the way I used to be. This also has valuable principles for those of you that have already failed, that have already passed the line. It means that you can let that go. It means that even though you messed up, you can start over because you must reckon, you must count that that is dead and you are new. You are alive to Christ Jesus. So even though you've, you've fallen, even though you've passed the line, even though you've made mistakes, you must realize that that is not your identity anymore. And you must reckon that this is dead. I'm going to ask for forgiveness, and I'm going to let it go. And if I fall again, I'm going to let it go again because this is who I am. And I will declare war until I look the way that Christ has said that I am. I will be volatile in becoming the man of God and the woman of God that God has called me to be because I am different. My old self is dead, and my new life is changed. You must start to claim your victory. You must realize who you are in Christ, and you have a new identity. Your old self is dead. The power that was binding you is broken. There are some of you, as we close, some of you in here today that you've had the same battle that I had, that you have the same struggles. God wants you to know, when I died on that cross, it wasn't just enough to get you to heaven. It was enough to break the power of that on your life. And I have given you the ability it's all been paid for. My power is now working in your life so that you can have a new life. And that is a message that Christ wants you to know. That if you are going to learn how to keep your body, you must know who you are now. You must know that you are no longer a pig, that you're no longer like the world, but that you have a new identity in Christ. And that you are alive to God and dead to that for the rest of your life. Every head bowed, every eye closed.